All right, here we go. Salute to Knicks Nation, special edition of Knicks Fan TV, presented by KnicksFanTV.com. We have our Game of the Week preview. Knicks taking on the Wizards this Wednesday night at Madison Square Garden in the rematch. And joining me today, my guest, my guy, my main man, been knowing this guy for over 20 years, went to school together at first at Hampton University, the real HU. Uh, he's been covering the Washington sports scene, covering sports in general, and the creator of the American Fan 365. He's my guy, Josh Williams, a.k.a. J. Will. Jay, how you feeling today, man? Man, I'm good, man. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be here, man. You know, you got your setup in the back. You see, I got my superimposed joint. I ain't, I'm in the kitchen. I don't, <laughs> I don't have anything sexy right now. So, you know, we're working to get there. But uh, really, really happy to be here, bro, and want to talk to you about the Knicks. Yeah. You know, your beloved Knicks. A absolutely, man. We, we come a long way from those uh, sports marketing, sports finance classes uh, yeah. <laughs> back at Hampton, man. So, uh, like I said, it's always good to be on here with you and, and to be collaborating with you uh, on, on this platform. It, it, it's an honor, man. But uh, let's talk about your Wizards, man. 18 and 26, 12th in the East right now. What's been your, your general impression of these wizards so far as, as we, you know, reach the halfway mark in the NBA season. The consistency of being inconsistent, that would be how it start that, you know, um, it, first off, you know, obviously, you know, the hard suffering Nick fans, you know, right now we're, we're discussing whose baby is the ugliest right now. So, <laughs> you know, it, it's kind of, that's, that's kind of how I started. But um, as you said, 18, um, 18 and 26, uh, we're two games out of the play in tournament. Uh, did I think we would be here? No, I didn't at all. But um, especially in year two under Wes Unsell Jr. Um, but uh, you know, this is this is the season we've got, and it's it's just seriously a sadness to see just the level of inconsistency. But they do that consistently, so it's like it's just kind of what it is. Yeah, so we'll and, and and you mentioned that right because that I think that was one of the things as Knicks fans we were fearful of when they were assembling this team and just based off of their performance last year, missing the playoffs, only winning thirty seven games is what is the yeah. direction that the team is going in? Are they building a team that is going to be stuck in the middle of the pack? Is there room for growth? And when you look at this Wizards team, I mean, seven years ago, they were one of the top teams in the East with the, the Wall and the Beal and the Gortats, the Morris team, so on and so forth. Yep. And now you guys kind of seem like you're kind of languishing in, in that middle ground. I mean, how, how do you you're, see you're in, in terms of you're the not, development? You're not, you're not good enough to be, you're not bad enough to be bad. And you're not good enough to be good. And um, it's, it's frustrating. Um, you know, but I mean, the main reason that it's frustrating, truthfully, is because they do have enough pieces. Like, they have enough. They have literally, they have a team with three all-stars potentially. You know what I mean? If Bill plays at his level, which was, you know, top 10, top 15 in the league, he's being paid like he's top 10, top 15 in the league. Um, and then you go with, with Chris Stapps, you know, he's right now he's averaging 22 and 8. You know what I mean? Like, for a big man in today's game, that's those are great numbers. You know, you can't argue against that. Then you say, you know, you go Kuzma, he's averaging 21 in eight. So it's like you've got three dudes that potentially, depending on how the team is performing, are all stars. So you got three all stars. You should be a solid team. Like you should at least be top tier in the in the you know in the conference for sure. We shouldn't be struggling or you know or thinking about struggling to even make the playoffs or be in the play in. That should be in the realm of thought. Yeah, and, and you mentioned Porzingis. We got a chance to see him last Friday night when the Knicks went to D.C. to take on the Wizards. And uh, what, what's yeah. been your, your general impressions of KP so far since you guys acquired him in the offseason? Listen, I love KP. You know what I'm saying? Um, we haven't had a big uh, of his caliber, truthfully, since, you know, you go all the way back to Chris Webber. That was probably the last high-level big that we've had, um, you know, that could go get his own points, could score. I mean, he can do he can do everything. He can score all three levels. Um, and, you know, but the main thing about the trade was we got rid of uh, Davis Bertans, uh, the Latvian, you know, I won't even say laser, but the Latvian let it go from, <laughs> let from it anywhere, fly. not think about it. Like, what? <laughs> like, bro, for real, bro, we down five. Like, we need a good shot right now. Like, what are you doing? But, but then also, you know, you get rid of Spencer Dinwiddie, who was a bit of a malcontent um, at the end of his time in D.C. So, 
and, and we did we gave up two dudes that we didn't really want and a second round pick that's a great trade <laughs> yeah I'm, ooh, I'm good as a Wizards fan I put my hand up that was a great trade I loved it loved it and, and I misspoke it wasn't an offseason trade it was actually by the deadline of last year so it was last actually year, a, yeah, a mid-season year, season trade year, mid-season Right. Mid-season right. trade and and KP when uh, he was interviewed by NBA.com about his time with the Knicks, he sounded like a guy that was uh, uh, you know a little bit remorseful about how things ended with the Knicks and and now he's on yeah. to to his third team. So it's gonna be interesting if he has some staying power and and how he impacts this this Wizards team going forward, man. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know listen, you know just for everyone to know a little bit more about my background, you know my brother played on the Knicks. So I had Nick's love in my heart. That's right. Shout, yeah, shout man, out to Jer- Jerome Williams, for, for yeah, Nick, right. former bull, right. play for number, dog, the junkyard man. dog. I've, I've had my moments at the garden, both as a visitor and as, you know, as, as a family member. So um, so I always will love the Knicks. You know what I mean? Um, but uh, but I loved Chris Stapps on the Knicks. You know what I mean? He was a unicorn. Legitimately, yeah. we had never seen anything like him before. Um, and, you know, now when you start thinking about the French alien Victor and, you know, some of the other bigs that have kind of come down the line since Chris Stapps, we've seen new dudes that are similar or can do more. But at the time when you guys drafted him, you know, everybody booed Phil, but then he ended up looking legit. So, yeah. you know, so I, I've always loved Chris Stapps. Absolutely. I mean, you know, injury concerns aside, I, I was a big Porzingis guy. And as you said, you look at what Wembyama is doing out there, a uh, bold, bold coming on strong with the magic. He's, yeah. he's, he's found new life yeah. there and you know, they're getting more and more skillful as they get taller, man. It, it's, it's incredible to see the evolution of the game, especially from, from these international players. Uh, now how about Kuzma, you know, Kuzma coming over from the Lakers. He, 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 he left LA and he seems to have found new life with the wizards man 21 and 7 on the year dropped 40 on the Knicks in the first matchup what's been your impressions of Kyle Kuzma so far look listen I I love I don't um you know when he was on the Lakers I felt like he pressed a lot because he didn't know his role his role was always ever-changing like some games LeBron might need him to do more some games LeBron might want him to chill and it's like, so he always was like kind of in like a stuck position where, you know, some games he's going to be getting the ball and some games he's just going to be out there floating. Um, on my team, um, he's really started to showcase what he can look like as a featured player. And as a featured player, I mean, listen, like I said, he's a borderline all-star. He's not all-star all the way, especially with a team that's, you know, miring in the muck. But, um, you know, but he's, he's proven to – 20 points a game in the NBA, bro, I don't care who you are. You're getting buckets. And he's probably about the – I trust him the most to get buckets, if that if that's the, the you know, the best way to say it. I don't trust his jump shot all the time. He'd be taking some ill-advised. Hmm. But, uh, but in terms of driving to the rack and those kinds of things, playmaking, he's, he's very, very proficient. I'll give him that. And now, you know, when you talk about, obviously, with the Wizards, you know, being in the bottoms of the league these last few years, they've been able to be at the top of the lottery or near there. And in, in recent years, you, you've drafted uh, Danny Avdia from, from Israel. You drafted Rui Hachimura from Gonzaga, Corey Kispert from Gonzaga, and most recently, Johnny Davis out of Indiana, the Indiana Hoosiers. What's been your thoughts? Oh, you, you don't look so happy, man. What, what's your thoughts about this well, Wizards young core, right, man? Talk I'll say, about I'll it, say man. this, right? So so as far as Denny, right? Denny, yeah. um, Denny right now is our probably our one of our best, most proficient defenders. Um, you know, can guard, can guard wings, can guard guards at the top of the, you know, key. But he's 6'9", so he can also bang in the post a little bit as well. Um, he gets in foul trouble sometimes, so that kind of takes away from his aggressiveness. But then he was top nine. He was top 10. He was the ninth pick of the 2020 draft. I didn't draft the person top nine. Well, excuse me, top 10 to just be a defensive stopper. That, that mm. it, like I would, cause he was supposed to have a little bit more of a, a Euro game, not, not Luca, of course, but like was supposed to have a little bit more playmaking in his bag and that kind of stuff. Um, but you know, you look at that draft, he was drafted ahead of Tyrese Halliburton and Tyrese Maxey. Mm. Mm. So when you look at it under that lens, we haven't had a guard since John. So, you know what I mean? So it wasn't like somebody was in the way. Why didn't we go get a point guard? Those kinds of things. Um, you know, think about where this team would be right now if that if those picks were made. 
You know what I mean? Maybe yeah. not necessarily Tyrese Maxey because he's a little bit more of a, you know, a good bench glue guy, but he still can go get you some buckets. Like, so, you know, but then when you, you know, you go, you say Rui, um, Rui is one of the more inconsistent, consistent guys mm. where Rui can drop 30 and 10 one game and then drop three and three the next game, same amount of minutes. So it's like, what are you? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's very hard to, to pigeonhole Rui Achimura. Um, But then Johnny Davis, I mean, he's the mysterious missing in action. He he gets an incomplete grade for me right now. Yeah. When you look at, you know, when you look at the, the draft, who, do, who who could we have drafted? Um, you know, for me, because Johnny Davis was the 10th pick. So, again, you're at the bottom level of the, of the lottery, but you're in lottery. I would have loved to have seen us move to go get Jaden Ivey. I would have loved to see us move to get Dyson Daniels. Now, Dyson Daniels in New Orleans hasn't – he hasn't really showcased too much yet, but in terms of him being a 6'8", 6'9", point guard type, you know what I mean, that runs the floor, controls the game, plays good, hard defense, mm. I would have much rather seen that versus a dude where it was like, yeah, he had one good year and a, a solid, you know, March Madness, and what else he got? Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see. Se- seems to be stuck right now, man. He's languishing in the G League. He had a brutal summer league. Just, just wasn't yeah. meeting, meeting standards. And uh, that's a tough. It's tough because, especially with the draft, man. And you're trying to build for the future, and, you, and you're hoping that when you're in the lottery, that these guys can really turn into impact players. And you look yeah. at these years that you guys have drafted. I mean, the opportunity costs are major. I mean, even in this draft right now, you got guys that were picked after Johnny Davis, Jalen Williams for OKC having a great year, uh, Jalen Duran. Yeah showing things with the, with the Pistons. Yeah. Agbaji, uh, Mark Williams, A.J. Griffin having a pretty good year with the Hawks. I like Tari Eason over there with uh, the Houston Rockets. Yeah, Malachi Branham of the Spurs, who who I liked as, as a wing. He's starting to show some potential. Walker Kessler with Utah. So uh, the opportunity cost, man, when, when you when you don't hit on these draft picks and can set your franchise back, man. And, that's, and like I said, top 10. You know what I mean? Yeah. So even though you're not top tier, you're not the top five. Obviously, we didn't get Chet. We didn't get, you know, um, Paolo. Obviously, that's who you want. But there's still dudes out there, you know. Yeah. And, you know, and, and this this draft has been a little bit quieter, you know what I mean? Like, in terms of, like, I came in the league and I'm impacting. But they're at least playing. <laughs> like, my dude's not even playing. And it's not like he got people in the way. I'll just say that. Yeah, and I think it's a, it's almost a similar situation with the Knicks. I think they've found value in picks later in the draft. When you look at Quickly, Quickly's yes. having a good year. Uh, Quentin Grimes has now been inserted into the start lineup this year. He's been a, a tremendous impact to this team's overall defense and, and efficiency from three. Uh, but the top end pick with Randall playing well at, at an all-star level, you have Obi getting, you know, sometimes single-digit minutes off the bench. How impactful yeah. is he? You know, he was college basketball player of the year, a standout there at Dayton. They haven't really been able to tap into his potential as far as an asset to this team. So, and then pr- prior to that, you had Kevin Knox, who's in, he's in Detroit. He's trying to, you know, find his way, but not when, when, when you think about opportunity calls, Shea Gilgis Alexander, Michael Porter Jr., Mikal Bridges, who, who was an easy pick there. All, all, of, all of those players, what would they have done in New York? You know what I mean? Right. Um, Ke- you know, and Kevin Knox, like we all wanted Kevin Knox to work, bro. Because what, what was he picked? He was top 10. He, uh, Kevin, I think he was uh, seven or eight. Yeah, 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 like he was, he was, he was right after you know those super high level, top level dudes. Nine. Like, he was nine. He was nine. Yeah. So I mean, same thing. A top ten pick, man. Top ten. You're supposed to. You're one of the first people to, to get up. Like yeah. you're supposed to be doing something. It's not supposed to be a wait and see. You know what I mean? You're, 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 yeah. We we've already seen. Like you know what I mean? We've already seen what you can do. So it, it they, those guys should be coming in and, and getting their opportunities and, and grabbing those opportunities. So. That's kind of my feeling on it. How about your coach, Wes Unsell Jr., man? Two years with the Wizards right now. Uh, won 35 wins last year, 18 so far this year, 16 combined years as an associate and assistant uh, um, in this league. Obviously, the son of the legendary Wes Unsell. W- what do you think of the job that uh, that he's been doing? This is where the tears begin to flow. Mm. So, you know, so my thing with Wes is this, and it's the same thing with my Hoyas. Mm. It had some nepotism situations <laughs> where it get, it becomes hard to move a guy like that. 
Mm. You know what I mean? Like you can't you can't fire Patrick. Lee. It's gonna be hard to fire Wes Unsell. Yeah. You know, it, like obviously if he completely you know craps the bed, then you know it becomes it just he forces your hand. But um, Wes was supposed to be brought in as a defensive mind. Like, it wasn't so much our offense. Like, our offense kind of was like, you know, we've had a top-tier offense in the league, in, you know, the last 10 years, really, mm-hmm. um, both in terms of rating and then just, you know, um, effort level and, and, and pace of play. Uh, but West was supposed to be brought in to help our defense because that's always been our bug, mm-hmm. even, you know, going all the way back to Gil Barina's time period where we were the Phoenix Suns of the East. You know what I mean? <laughs> we didn't play no defense. We was going to outscore you. We didn't play no defense. Um, you know, and so the, the level that I see, I see them lock in sometimes, like for instance, the game in DC, um, you know, I want to say that was Thursday. Uh, when, when that game got tight down the stretch, you saw the wizards lock in, Yeah, you saw them lock in, you saw, you know, now you saw, uh, Randall make some tough shots. You saw, uh, Jalen hit some tough shots, but you know, you saw the overall level rise and, if they could do that over the course of a full game, we could be something. But you got to consistently do that. Like that has to be the calling card because you know you're going to get your opportunities on the other end. So you know, for me with West, it really just comes down to you know pick a struggle, bro. Like we got to pick a lane one way or another. So that's my feeling on him. Yeah, absolutely. And we're talking to Josh Williams, owner and creator of the American Fan 365. He's also covered the Washington sports scene for a number of years as well. And as he said, the brother of former Nick, Jerome Williams, a.k.a. the Junkyard Dog. And he talked about Georgetown too, man. I, I hate seeing my guy Patrick Ewan going out like that. And that, that was one of the reasons, bro, why I never wanted him to coach the Knicks. You know what I'm saying? Because okay. it's just... It, because when things go bad and they will go bad, you don't want that to tarnish his legacy even more. And then it becomes a harder thing. Like you said, to fire him. It's looking, yeah. it's looking ugly out there at Georgetown right now, you know, 20 something they, they, consecutive losses. It's bad. They, they, they've recruited well. You know yeah. what I mean, they recruited well. We're in a light big East. Like it's not like the big East got world beaters and right. everybody's afraid of the big East. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, man, yeah, that many losses in a row, you know, it's 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 rough, bro. It's rough. But Jordan talking about taking our taking the sponsorship away is getting that rough. Oof, from, I'm, from, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I was gonna say that that would be tough, know. man. That that don't that hold would, me, man. Don't hold me. Yeah. No, that that would be tough, man. So, in terms of like, like you know, back to the Wizards now. In terms of like overall direction, you know, there's there's some fans now who are regretting this Bradley Beal extension. He's now the fifth highest player in the league. He's not playing as much. We'll see if he plays on Wednesday. He's, he's nearing a return. Uh, but with you yeah. guys, twelfth in the East and sign it kind of in that middle of nowhere where do you where do you want this team to go do you want them to continue to build around Beal or do you think they should really start peeling this thing back well I mean look at it this way um when you when one when you give a guy that kind of money right when you give a guy that kind of money it becomes near impossible to move him and if we do move him um, not only I think I'm not sure if he has a no trade clause. He does. Even he does have no trade clause. Right? Yeah. I, thought, I, yeah. thought he, I thought he put that in there. Mm-hmm. So he has a no trade clause. So that already means he can limit where he, he's going to go. Mm-hmm. But, you know, even if we get other teams involved and all that kind of stuff, you know, when when uh, I, when when you sent over, you know, kind of the topics and everything and I thought about it, like, did I want Brad to be moved before? Um, we every every deal I ever saw never really got us better. You know what I mean? Like, it wasn't like we got better. It wasn't like we really got worse. So it was like, I'd much rather, we already, you know, the way we already got rid of John, you know what I mean? Now, in retrospect, that deal might have been a really good deal because it got us healthy under the cap because we were, you know, at luxury or above luxury for years. And so to trade John Wall for Russell Westbrook and then move him for pieces and really reset the team, it, Last year, when we started out like a house on fire, it was like, oh, my God, this deal was genius. Mm. But now we're kind of stuck again. And um, especially, like you said, with Brad getting hurt a lot now, um, it makes it tough. But I just want Brad to go hoop, man. Like, mm. quiet all the noise. If he, gonna, if he can go be a guy that can get us, you know, 30 a game again, 28 a game, we become a very dangerous team. He just has to 
do better in clutch moments. He's always been no clutch gene Brad to be. So we'll see. Tricky situation, man. Obviously a tricky situation, especially where you guys are in the East. But if he does come back on Wednesday, as we kind of segue into this game matchup, man, my matchup to watch is no doubt Bradley Beal uh, against uh, the Knicks' second-year guard in Quentin Grimes, man. Grimes, who's really been that jack-of-all-trades for the Knicks, man. He, he's been the guy who's taken on the tough matchups. He's, he's taken on the hardest assignments on the perimeter for the Knicks, no, no matter the size, whether it's a three or a two. He's taking on yeah. that assignment, and then obviously on the offensive end, they need him for his three-point shooting. Uh, what do you think about that matchup, man, Beal and Grimes? Well, for me, it's more than likely going to be Monte Morris and Grimes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't trust the Beal's going to be out there. Yeah. If it's Beal, I mean, if it's Beal, Brad don't play no defense. Brad locks in for about six minutes of game action on the defensive side of the ball usually. So, you know, now if Brad, you know, now in terms of Grimes matchup with Beal on the defensive side of the ball and Beal's got the ball in his hands, um, it really just becomes, you know, like how Brad's feeling that day. You know what I mean? Like if he's getting good shots, he's got to hit him. You know what I mean? Um, but Quentin Grimes, he's, he's, he's like his last name is perfect for him. He's a grimy dude. Yeah. He's gritty. You know what I mean? Like he plays hard. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's really, he's, he's really grabbed a hold of his opportunity to, uh, to get more game action and has looked great. So, um, it's, it's not a great matchup for the wizards by any stretch, whether it's Monte or either, uh, Bradley Beal. The thing I like about Grimes so much is number one is anticipation skills. Um, point. Yeah. just like knowing where guys are going to go, get into your spots before you do. He's an absolute pest. Even when you have the size matchup or the height matchup over him, he's going to make it tough. Every shot that you take is going to be tough. You know, the way that he navigates screens, it, it's it's yeah. incredible. He never stops hustling, man. Never stops hustling. He, look, he, he, he's going to make you work. And, yeah. you know, and listen, if you're going to go get 30, I want it to be an ugly 30. Yeah. So you're going to, you know, you're limiting other opportunities for teammates, all those kinds of things. You know what I mean? So – uh, I, I love him. I love, I love his play style. And, you know, and, and New York always gravitates to those kinds of players because that's how New York is. You know what I mean? So he's 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 building a fan base mm -hmm. every game. Every game, his fan base goes up precipitously. And, um, you know, I wish him nothing but success. Yeah, no, no question about it. Now, in their last matchup last Friday, man, Knicks were able to squeak this one out 112-108. But as you said in the fourth quarter, Wizards made it tough, man. Knicks were clinging to an 11-point lead with two minutes left. But between yep. Kuzma and Porzingis, they got, it hot. they got hot in the offensive end. Wizards' defense has started clamping up. What do you see from a Wizards standpoint um, are some of the keys to a Wizards' victory in this rematch on Wednesday? Uh, I think, I mean, the, the main thing really is making Randall work, making Brunson work. If, you know, um, whether it's hedging on screens or just just being a body. Yeah, you know I mean, if you're going to hit tough shots, we'll make them hit 10 tough shots. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't give up easy buckets. Um, and then, you know, really, like I said, the, the Wizards were inconsistent. We... Mm. We miss more crucial free throws down the stretch of games. Like that game, Kuzma gets fouled on a three, misses a free throw. He hits all three of those free throws. It's a one point game. That gets all the way to one. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because we because we were playing the foul game. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris Stapps missed a free throw. Like all those kind of things. Like down the stretch of games, man. People, you know, my, my dad used to always say they're free. They're free. Like, you've got to take advantage of those moments, especially stopping the clock down the stretch of games because you're scoring and the clock isn't moving. So, you know what I mean? Like, if you have those opportunities, you have to grab them because we literally were right there. It was mm -hmm. right there. And then, you know, and then, of course, once you met, you miss a possession or anything like that and you keep fouling, the, the Knicks hit their free throws and they were able to lock it down. So. Yeah, certainly, certainly. And and I, I think for me, from a Knicks standpoint, just come, going off of the game on Friday, uh, number one, you know, for all the inconsistency that the Wizards have, have gone through and experienced in these games, the half-court defense is pretty good. You know, they're, they're top 10 in the league in opponents' two-point percentage. I think they're number six in opponents' f effective field goal percentage. And so I think for the Knicks, number one, they got to move the ball. What was evident to me in their last matchup, they only had 15 assists in the game total. Yeah. 
especially in the first yeah. half. Things were very mucky. Knicks couldn't shoot the ball worth anything. I mean, they only finished shooting. They did finish shooting 44 from the field, but only 27% from three. Um, so I think they, they got to move the ball, get that Wizards defense moving. Where the Knicks do have that advantage is, is points in the paint. You know, 50 points in the paint in, in that game on Friday against 28 versus the Wizards. Gafford did yeah. leave that game a little bit early after after Julius punched it on him. So I'll be yeah, interested Julius, to see. Yeah, that, yeah, that, that was that game, right? I was <laughs> yeah, trying to remember. That was a homicide. Gafford that. got yammed on. Yeah. God bless. Yeah. Daniel Gafford looked like he had a stroke on the sideline. Like he was like. Yeah. Uh, it was it was bad. He it looked bad. like he he was ready to check out, man. So I think points in the paint is, is where the Knicks they they have an advantage over most in the league between Julius Randle getting you know rebounds, Mitchell Robinson, Jalen Brunson's yeah. ability to get into the paint now, R.J. Barrett being back. So you know that that's yeah. what the Knicks do. They're not a good three point shooting team. They like to get it in inside, draw contact, get to the line, and then hopefully hit some free throws. So. Yeah. You know, I, I think they certainly should have their advantages there. Another area where I, I think the Knicks certainly have an advantage is in fast break points. Because as, as as good as the Wizards are in the half court, their transition defense has been really, really suspect. And we saw that Trash. especially Trash. In, in that game on Friday, man. Emmanuel quickly, I mean, in that fourth quarter, he ripped off about nine out of the Knicks' 11 points. Yep. Uh, and a lot of that was in transition. RJ, Jalen Brunson, you know, Knicks get out and run. And they were able to catch the, the Wizards off balance and, and really get some easy points um, in transition. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, that goes to guard play. You know what I mean? Guards getting back, uh, at least limiting medium breaks because uh, it wasn't even so many fast break situations with the Knicks. It was a lot of medium breaks mm. where it's like, you know what I mean? People are out of position. People aren't getting back on defense quick enough. Uh, just getting good looks, good opportunities. Um, but uh, yeah, like I said, inconsistently consistent so that is the wizards yeah and then in in the um in the post game press conference uh, Wes Unsold had attributed it to um you know having a lot of guys crash the boards because they got to help on the boards because you have uh such good rebounders on the Knicks and Mitchell Robinson and Julius Randle and even an Isaiah Hartenstein will, will get after it on the boards sometimes yeah. yeah and so he attributed it to that and um, so, you know, it's just going to be very interesting to see how, how they uh, how they balance the floor um, in, yes. in, the, in the rematch. And then bench play. You know, one of the things with the Knicks as of late, when Tom Thibodeau has shortened the rotation, Emmanuel quickly has been, been doing great off the bench. And obviously he went back home to D.C. and was showing out in front of his family. He had a great game, 18 points there. But outside yeah. of that, they only had eight more points off the bench there uh, with Obi Toppin. I think the Knicks bench scoring struggles could be a key in the in this game. Well, what's your take on, on how the Wizards rotation is looking and how they how do they utilize I mean, their it bench? Really, it really comes down to, you know, um, like you said, in terms of your interior. So Daniel Gafford being in there, I actually love Daniel Gafford. He's a he's a higher guy, gives rebounds. Can, you know, he's an undersized big a little bit, but but, but plays above the rim, um, you know, but then when you start talking Rui and Denny and those guys, um, they don't always give a lot of scoring punch, but if they can, if they can hold down the other team, you know, whether, you know, whether that's the starters or the other, or the bench, other bench guys, guys um, it does, it does play actually, in our hands because you know, our guys actually, actually, you know, you know, they actually do their see. job a lot of times. Yeah. So, so we'll see. Yeah. And then, you know, the way this thing can come down, like if if the Wizards are, are able to maintain their, their defensive effort on the on the half court, yeah, it's coming down to the fourth quarter, man, because the Knicks have been one of the worst fourth quarter teams in the league, minus 15 in points differential. The Wizards, on the other hand, are plus 26 in the fourth quarter. I think this game, as we saw on Friday night, this game, if the Knicks are not hitting their threes, and you yeah. know, you're not having a, a you know crazy game by either Brandon or Runches. I, I think this game could still come down to that to the fourth quarter, man. Well, well, CP Casey, why do you think we have such a good overall, you know, plus minus in the fourth quarter? What what do you think? Well, for one, you you got Kuzma going off. You got Porzingis cooking. 
I mean, no. what's your take? It's because we lose it, KC. You <laughs> <laughs> playing catch up. We, we, play we got to look. We we go to the fourth quarter down fifteen, baby. Like we out here making miracles. We I'm making living down living age. Like so so yeah. That's that's the reason why our rating is so good in the fourth. Because like they do this to me every time. They they'll cover the spread. Don't worry, we will cover the spread. Yeah. But uh, but when it comes down to it, it's, it's quarters one through three where it was trash and I was watching a, a 40 point first and we trying to figure right. out how to, how to break this points back down the rest of the way. Like, yeah, it's, it's a struggle. It's yeah. A struggle. It makes sense, man. It's, it's, it's a frantic push to make this thing respectable. And as I said, Nick's had an 11 point lead um, with two minutes to go in the fourth and, and yeah. still took some heroics to close it off. 112 to 108. And then they will see each other again. Wednesday night at the Garden, man. Knicks four and a half point favorites in this game, man. Give, give me your score prediction. I think it'll be, I think it'll be high scoring because we don't play no damn defense. I think, <laughs> I think it'll be 122, 116 New York Knicks. All right. I, I think the Wizards will cover, but I, I picked the Knicks to win. I'm going 115 to 111. I think okay. they get the job done. Another cardiac Nick affair, as we call it here in New York. Another <laughs> fourth quarter where you're sweating it out after you've been up by 15, 17 in the first three quarters. Uh, yeah. hey, it's one of those matchups. And then, you know, if Beal comes back, let, let's see how how that works, man. Let's yeah, see yeah, I mean, you know, because uh, RJ, RJ didn't play in that first game either. That The game on Thursday, he, right? He, he wasn't, wasn't playing Kuzma was cooking him. Yeah. Uh, RJ did play and Kuzma was eating his food. Oh, what was, was he? I didn't play. I, I caught the... I caught basically middle of the third on, and I didn't see RJ out there. So that he might, he just might have been a little bit quiet that night. Yeah, okay. it wasn't a good night Fair for enough. him offensively. And then Kuzma was, was really eating his food, man. So, you know, <laughs> that that is also what well, one of the matchups to watch is, is that RJ. Yeah, yeah, no, that is. Deal. That, um, that a thousand percent is. Yeah, defensively, he just hasn't been that strong this year. So we'll see how things play out. And if, if Bradley Beal comes back, you get your big three there. It, it could be a, a much uh, much closer game, man. Uh, and once again, we're talking to Josh Williams, owner and creator of the American Fan 365, also has covered the Washington sports scene for a number of years, man. Uh, Jay, tell the people about the American Fan 365, man. What was the uh, the genesis of the yeah. American Fan, and, and, and what are you hoping to accomplish over these next few years? Well, so so the American fan, honestly, I started it. Uh, I came up with the concept even before I came up with uh, my Ball Stars brand where I work with retired NBA players. I came up with it in 2012. Um, you know, I had kind of moved out of sports. You know, I worked at the NBA. I, I ran the marketing department at the Basketball Hall of Fame. I actually worked. I was an intern with the Wizards uh, when Casey and I were, uh, were in college. And, um, you know, and so the concept of the show initially was um, – really Anthony Bourdain meets sports. Mm -hmm. I wanted to meet sports fans because, you know, I'm a sports fan, huge sports fan of all my teams. Um, but I wanted to hear fan stories. I wanted to, you know, kind of get to the root of why we, you know, slave and cry over the Knicks, mm -hmm. over the Wizards, um, you know, teams that haven't won, you know, frankly, like, you, you know, you're not a bandwagon fan if you're a Cleveland Browns fan. There ain't no bandwagon for the Browns. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's so like, you know, come, man. yeah, that's loyal. That's real loyalty, man. You spending your hard earned money. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to meet those people, but you know, coming from a corporate background, I also wanted to uh, be a bridge or a conduit between the fan and then also the front office and the players. I, because I've lived all those worlds. I've lived in the NBA family. I've worked on the professional corporate side of basketball as well. So I wanted to kind of be the uniter of that. And um, and that's that was really the uh, you know, the the main thought process behind the concept. And so now I built a uh, podcast off of it um, and uh, looking to start doing some uh, some long form content as well. Absolutely, man. Well, we definitely wish you well on that. Um, let the people know where, where they could find you. Yeah, so the American Fan 365 on YouTube. Um, please like, share, subscribe. We're also on Instagram. Um, I've got some goofy videos on uh, on TikTok as well because we got to get into TikTok, Jesus. Yes, of course. Um, I'm on Twitter, but I don't tweet. So if you find me, it's me. But uh, yeah, you ain't gonna find much on there just yet. Uh, 
brother's got too much stuff going on. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, yeah. And also on Facebook as well. So the American fan 365. American fan 365. Yeah. And lastly, man, as we, we talked about your brother playing for the Knicks, well, any, any fun or, or, you know, memorable Knicks stories from, from that time that you could remember, you know? Oh what, man. What, um, you okay. So, with, so, games you went to? Yeah. Yeah. So when Jerome was there, this was, uh, he came in the, um, the Jamal Crawford trade. Right. Jerome and Jamal were traded uh, um, from Chicago to mm -hmm. the Knicks. So this was Jerome, the end of Jerome's career. Uh, his last year was with the Knicks. Um, he was on the Stephon Marbury team. Mm -hmm. um, but the energy of the garden, and I want Knicks fans to know this because I don't know how many of them have gone to games in other places. Um, the reason that that players, you know, I, you know, whenever I interview former players or other guys, even in other sports, hockey, um, the reason that players love the garden so much is because the energy is simply different. There's a different, there's a different energy level. Um, there's a different roar. The, the crowd is, is like its own entity in New York. And that's what makes it so New York. And, um, and that's what makes it its own like show. You know, um, when I talk to a lot of, you know, like when I, uh, Ray Allen told me this, uh, you know, one of my guys, one of my legends out here in Vegas, Marcus Banks has told me this, mm -hmm. the lighting, at the garden, yeah. you know, is, is very uh, cinematic. It makes you feel like, you know, you're on a stage. On a stage. And, um, and so players really always talk about the garden just for those reasons. So for me, you know, being a part of that, um, like I said, being, you know, in the Knicks family and then also seeing the upgrades that they made to MSG and, and the renovations that have gone so well, um, you know, it, it's, it's going to be a great, a great facility for the next 40 years. Yeah. Yeah. As you mentioned, the renovations, Um, we, we've done a couple of fan events up there on the Chase Bridge. It's a real nice yeah. area to, to watch the games. And uh, you got the Delta Lounge. I'm going tomorrow. They are opening up the Chase Lounge now. So I'm going to okay. get a preview of the Chase Lounge tomorrow. We'll see how that's looking. But yeah, the garden looks great. It, it's it's uh, it, it, you just hope that the Knicks can really turn it into a home court advantage. Because right now they're 11 and 12 at home and 14 and 8 on the road. So hopefully they can <laughs> relax a little bit and enjoy the garden the way opposing players enjoy the garden and like to put on a show against yeah. the Knicks every damn yeah. night. So they got to cut that out and, and really settle in at home. Uh, but um, but yeah, man, gr great show. Absolutely great to have you on, man. It's great to collab on this and and uh, we're certainly going to do more of these, man. So thanks again for the time, bro. Really appreciate it. Anytime, man, anytime. Knicks fans TV, I love you guys. Uh, I'm so thankful that you guys have really supported my guy, uh, Casey. You know what I'm saying? Like, I remember when he started this journey and even before he started the journey and was like, man, I think I can do this. And, you know, when I told him, I was like, you know, listen, you're different because you have to understand Nick fans are like no other fan in this country. And and I, I felt like he could do it. And he, not only did he surpass what I thought he could do, but I think he might even surpass what he could. He thought he could do. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm so thankful for each of, of you guys supporting him because he's living his dream. So I, I love it. Appreciate you, man. Josh Williams, the creator of the American Fan 365, man. Make sure you guys go check him out. Jay, good luck to the Wizards on Wednesday night. And, uh, and we'll chop it up again soon, man. Yes, sir, brother. I'll take you. I'll talk to you. Take care. All right. Take care.